What do scientists mean when they use the word construct? Why should you care? And how can you measure construct validity? Stay tuned. There are a lot of words that get tossed around by scientists and professors that they never really explain well. The word construct is one of those words. And if you're not used to seeing it, it's really hard to understand. And it's almost like it's, it's a fancy academic word used to obfuscate what it, they're actually trying to say. It's our jobs, after all, to use words like obfuscate instead of a commonly used word like hide so that people will think that we're smart when we're saying things that are really actually obvious and simple. Now let me give you an example. Let's take a simple idea, something we could study like how often dogs have bad dreams. Now this wording just simply won't do. People without years of training will understand what you mean and what you did, and you can hardly justify your salary and tuition dollars by saying something like that. So let's fix it. First, an obvious fix is to use the word canine instead of dog. But we can't say bad dreams. Maybe we could use the word for sleep disorders, right? Like parasomnias. Night terrors have been labeled as a specific kind of parasomnia called arousal parasomnias. So that gives us something more like prevalence and frequency of arousal parasomnias in canines. Now that's a proper academic description. Okay, I'm joking here and maybe I'm getting slightly off track, but it really feels like this sometimes. Here's an actual sentence from a journal article on parasomnias. Steady, gradual transformation and resolution of symptoms suggests that the etiology of parasomnias may be maturational in nature. Wouldn't it have been easier to say that sleep disorders in kids change and resolve over time, so they're probably the result of an immature brain and they'll probably grow out of it? <laughs> I swear I've seen people do this only to make themselves sound smarter than they actually are, and I've even seen people get the fancy words wrong and it backfires. <laughs> anyway, what was this video about again? Oh yeah, constructs. I did a search in Google Scholar for construct, and here are some of the results I found. I mean, look at these titles inspiration as a psychological construct, rethinking context as a social construct, quality of life as a dynamic construct. Now what do these even mean? I feel like a title like that is going to be followed by like 30 pages of just academic gibberish. Well hopefully I can help decipher what this term construct means and make it so you have an easier time when this word gets tossed around. The word construct is kind of like an anything word. It could actually be referring to almost anything. It's an abstract concept in the way that like infinity isn't really a number and equal to isn't really referring to any one thing in particular. Constructs are the invisible attributes that we're often trying to measure, such as intelligence, stress, happiness, pain, self-efficacy, narcissism, humility, anxiety, and on and on and on. Almost everything we study as it relates to the mind and behavior are constructs. Usually, if you ask a psychologist, hey, what do you study? They're going to answer with a construct. They'll say, I study gratitude, humility, motivation, memory. In order to study these things that we care about, we have to measure them. But these things can't be measured directly. This leads to another important concept in science, construct validity. When we look at how well our chosen measurement method measures the actual construct we're trying to measure, we are measuring the construct validity. In D&D, you have a character sheet and you can assign points to different characteristics. But in real life, there's no like dipstick into your brain that we can pull out to measure a specific construct. Instead, we have to measure something that we think is related to the construct we're interested in. We've done whole videos on measuring some of the constructs I just mentioned, like intelligence and narcissism, which you can check out. But basically, you have to find some way to operationalize, that is, measure that construct that you're interested in. I also have a video on operational definitions that I'll link in the description if you want a deeper dive. But basically, if I want to know, for example, how much pain someone is in, I could come up with ways to do that. Maybe they could describe the pain verbally, or I could ask them to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, or match the face that best describes their pain. I could measure how long it took them to complete a crossword puzzle, since uh, I might think pain would distract them from doing the crossword puzzle. In Western movies, they always give a person a stick to bite down on while they remove a bullet or something. So maybe we could measure bite force. Some of these measurements are going to be more accurate than others. In other words, they will have higher 
construct validity. Construct validity is an important tool to improve our measurements and ensure that we're measuring what we think we're measuring and to be able to compare whether different measurements are actually measuring the same thing. The other really cool thing about constructs is they're not isolated from one another. When we try to understand the relationships between constructs, how they interact with each other to produce behavior, well, that's what a theory is. I'll link my video about how important theories are and how they relate to other tools like laws and hypotheses below. But one way to understand the idea of a theory is to take all of the constructs that are important to a behavior and arrange them together in one place. As an example, here's a theory called the theory of planned behavior, which I first saw when I took a course on attitudes and attitude change. This theory was developed by Isaac Eisen in the mid 1980s to explain how our attitudes about a behavior can influence our intentions to do that behavior, which then can in turn become actual behavior. So let's take exercise for an example. According to this theory, whether I develop an intention to exercise or not is going to depend on several things. My own attitude about exercise is one construct that's important to include. After all, I'm not likely to exercise if I think it's a horrible waste of time and I hate it. But even if I think exercise is fantastic, I also have to worry about how other people I care about will judge me. So that is covered under the construct of subjective norms, whether I think other people think it's okay to do this behavior or not. A third important construct in the theory is whether I think I have control over my behavior or not. Maybe I think I can't exercise because I'm too out of shape, or I can't afford a gym membership, or even if I did exercise, it wouldn't do any good. If I don't think I have any control in the situation, that can impact my intentions to do that behavior. So those three constructs then determine whether I form an intention to exercise, which is a construct all its own. But this theory suggests that intentions are required in order for me to actually go on to perform the behavior. So this whole theory is made up of constructs. We can then try to measure these constructs. We can manipulate them confirm whether this is how they are related or not. We might find new constructs to add and so on. Through this process, we might find that some of the arrows need to be moved around or that some constructs should be removed. But the more we test and revise this theory through the scientific process, the better our understanding will be. This is the engine that drives science, that helps our understanding become better and better over time. So when you see the word construct, don't be put off by it. It just means a thing that we are indirectly measuring. Inspiration as a psychological construct just means it's something that we can measure and study. Cultural identity as a social construct just means that it's something that's influenced by the people around us. And quality of life as a dynamic construct means that your quality of life is something that changes relative to your current situation. If you found this video helpful, we can measure that construct when you hit the like button. Subscribe to get more videos on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. The rhetorical dissonance created by expertise dynamics is incongruent with the goals of public engagement in discourse on empirical epistemology. Given sufficiently high self-efficacy, the persistence of verbal perplexity is not subject to ego depletion effects or similar deleterious psychological fatigue.